Hi, I'm Larry Higgins with Skip Genie, and I'm back at the Propeo Academy talking about skip tracing. In this section, we're going to talk about what I call the escalation process and what, what all that entails. And this is really where a lot of investors, where they fail. You know, if you're going to skip trace, be methodical and do it right. That could, we'll cover texting, we'll cover social media, emails, and we'll also look at some additional uses for skip tracing other than just skip tracing you know, owners of distressed properties. So in this process, the first thing you're doing is you're making phone calls. So on these skip trace reports, you get a lot of phone numbers sometimes. You, some, a lot of people may have four or five numbers and others are gonna have 10 to 15 phone numbers. So you, there's no way around it. Sometimes you're just gonna have to dial, dial, dial. It's gonna be a lot, some more than others. There's no way around it. You never know if the good number for a person is gonna be the first one on the top of their list or is it gonna be at the bottom? I've seen it happen either way. So once you get your report, just start dialing all those numbers. As you're going through, obviously you want to eliminate and remove the bad numbers. So if you have to go back through later and make phone calls for this person, trying to reach this person, you're not going to waste valuable time calling bad numbers. Uh, you're going to have a lot of what I call questionable or uncertain numbers. These are going to be numbers that they're working, but the phone either rings and rings and rings, nobody answers. Uh, maybe you get a generic voicemail. And what I call a generic voicemail is, you know, you get a voicemail and they just say, hey, leave a message. Well, you don't know who it is. You know, it, they just say, leave a message. If you're looking for Bill, you don't know if that's Bill. So that's, that's a, a questionable number. Uh, sometimes you get mailbox full, mailbox not set up, or this subscriber is not taking calls right now. So you would want to notate working number, just don't know if it's the right number. Uh, Obviously, if you get uh, a confirmed number, you're going to want to notate that, highlight it, star it, whatever. Bingo, you found it. And the only way to know if it's confirmed is, it, obviously, if they give you their name, you're calling and trying to reach Sandy, you get a voicemail, she says, hey, this is Sandy, leave a message. So now, you know, you just, you found the right number, it's just a matter of trying to get, a re get her to call you back or a response from her in some way. Another way is if a family or friend you say you couldn't reach them, you maybe even accidentally call a family member or a friend. They occasionally, not as often, a lot of family and friends are very guarded with other people's contact info, but occasionally they'll go ahead and give you a phone number or an email or something like that. So then you know you've got a good one. So the second part of the escalation process is you've been dialing all those numbers, you've got questionable numbers or good numbers, and nobody will call you back or they won't answer. So rather than just keep dialing or just keep waiting for somebody to call you back, send a text message. Some people, for different reasons, some people are much more apt to reply to a text message than they are to call you back. You know, I know people, I can be bad about myself even checking my voicemails. Um, or maybe they just, maybe they didn't get your number, they lost it, they meant to call you back and they just forgot. Um, Texting, a lot of people just prefer text messages. And I've seen it time and time again where I've left messages with people that never called me back. Then I take the time to send a text message. Sometimes literally within two minutes, they're replying back to me, let me know, hey, this is me, what do you need? Or how can I help you? Or something to that effect. Uh, the text should basically just be a variation of your, of your scripts. My, I send a text message, it's a really long text message, but I answer who I am, why I'm contacting them, and it's, it's just the scripts that we use. I just put it in the actual text and hit send. That's it. Uh, no, I don't change, no major changes there, and it's been pretty effective for us. An example of this and why it paid off so well for us was a house we did off of Bahia Road. Uh, owner was deceased, found three heirs. There, uh, three children involved. They were easy to find. Each of them had several questionable numbers. They were all working, but I didn't, I, at that point, I was leaving messages for all these questionable numbers for all three heirs. I just didn't know if any of them were good. Nobody was calling me back. So after I think it was a day or two, I took a text message and I just sent that exact same text message it was specific to the property, but generic enough that I could send it to all three heirs. I just sent to every single questionable number, just copy and paste, copy and paste, and sent it. And 
you know, I think the heir that replied to me, I think it was about an hour or two after I sent the text message, she had replied. Sending that text message led to us getting a deal, which was an $80,000 deal. That's why I tell people, you may think taking the time to text is, is a waste of time. It's not worth the effort. If, if that was the only deal I did all year because I took the time to text, at $80,000, it was worth every bit of texting that I had to do to do it. So that's just something to keep in mind. What happens when you can't get them on the phone or you don't have a good phone number? So you, it's not just calling. You can't even text because you don't have a good phone number. In this case, a, a natural step would be go to social media or e and e emails. Uh, biggest, most common site, obviously, is Facebook. Uh, I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody. But say you search, you find them on Facebook, but they're just not active. That's one thing to pay attention to. Have they done any post? Or did they set up their account in you know, 2009? They've never sent a post or anything like that. Or maybe they're there, they're not active, but they've got a bunch of friends. You know, look and see, are there friends in there? Can you go to a friend that looks like a relative? Kind of a circuitous route, go to friends and family uh, on their Facebook profile to see if you can, they can help you get in touch. Um, really getting into the weeds, another thing you can do is look at their pictures. Uh, I've found critical, critical information that helped me establish contact with somebody when I was at a complete dead end. I took the time to look at her photos. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that as an example here in a second. And another thing to note about Facebook is sometimes it's a real common name and there's a lot of search results. This is a cool little tip here. So in your skip trace report, you get email addresses. You can take that email address and search it in the search bar on Facebook. And if their Facebook profile is linked to that email, it may take you straight to them. So that's a, a cool little shortcut to, that maybe helps you save some time or not just time, helps you find the right person on Facebook when you're looking for them like that. Uh, LinkedIn's another uh, popular social media site that I, I've used for several people. It's pretty easy to narrow down the right person based off a of location and uh, maybe you know their job history or what type of work they do. So that's another one to keep in mind. And of course we've got Instagram and, and some of the other big ones, but I've had the best luck with Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, with the emails, doesn't matter what service you use, across the board they're generally kind of spotty on the accuracy. So as an example, my report has five different email addresses. One of them's right. It's the very first email address I ever set up. Um, I don't check it that often, but it, it, it's a good email address. Uh, so just keep in mind that it's definitely hit and miss on those. It is worth it when you're hitting dead ends everywhere else or if you're able to do just an email blast where you can automate and send out a thousand emails at once in, in that circumstance is very worthwhile. So when I mentioned Facebook, just to highlight the, the importance of using social media and how it can make a difference. A property I was working on had two heirs that lived in, I think they were in Mississippi, and I was at a dead end. The brother, uh, there's a brother and sister. I was pretty sure that the brother was in jail, but I wasn't positive. That, that would have explained why I couldn't reach him. But the sister, I just couldn't find anything on her. And I was really desperate to get in touch with them. It was a hot deal over in the Sagemont area, a uh, uh, fairly well-known subdivision, the Houston area. But uh, I just kept dialing, dialing, couldn't get her on the phone, looking for emails, nothing's going through. I find her Facebook profile. And even then, there's nothing there. I mean, just very little activity for years, no friends, but she did have a few pictures. So I took the time to look at her pictures. And I didn't, again, I don't, not looking for anything specific, just looking. And I see a screenshot of, a, of her local newspaper, and it's a write-up about her and her battle with breast cancer, uh, I think two or three years prior. And it just told her story, and at the very end of it, it mentioned, you know, she's in full remission and she's gone back to work at so-and-so engineering company in, you know, Biloxi or wherever she was. That was pretty key information. I didn't think she was still there. I didn't know she was still there, but I decided to, I looked up the company online and I called them. I was hoping somebody there could tell me how to reach her. Well, when I called, <laughs> the lady that answered at the company I called was the lady I was looking for. She was she handled the incoming calls. So 
that picture filled me in on a bunch. It gave me her employer, and it also told me why there was so much financial distress. It also told me why she was avoiding phone calls because she had basically gone into a lot of debt trying to pay for her cancer treatments. She did have liens, she had judgments, and it just that one picture off of her Facebook profile just gave me a, filled me in on everything that was going on with her and ultimately got me in contact with her. The next step in what I call the escalation process, you just can't reach these people, emails, Facebook, social media, phone calls, relatives, you know, door knocking. It's tried and true. And maybe, maybe you can't reach them, but you know where they live. Uh, I don't have any issues with door knocking. The only reason I don't do more of it is it's not the most efficient use of my time. If I'm trying to talk to 50 owners, I can talk to 50 of them faster if I'm doing it on the phone or the computer versus driving all over the place and knocking on doors. So if I am going to go door knock, I generally, I'm going to recommend bring a copy of a contract with you and, and, and a letter. Uh, that way, if they are there, you've got a contract, you can try and seal the deal on the spot. Or if they're not, you can leave a copy of the contract. I, I wouldn't recommend signing it, but at least the terms, what your price is, your offer, things of that nature, and just a brief letter, who you are and what you want to do. You know, how can you help them other than just, you know, just introduce yourself and let them know what you're willing to do. Uh, this will, this has been effective for us in a couple circumstances. Uh, one guy, I had a good phone number, couldn't get him to reply to me. Uh, it was driving me crazy. He was just, he, he just did not want to call me back or text me. So I said, I'm just going to go knock on his door. And nobody answered. And somebody may have even been there. I, I'm pretty sure somebody was in that house, but they were just ignoring me. Uh, this was a very distressed property. I had a lot of reason to suspect that he would want to sell. Inherited, huge tax issue, very run down. And so I go knock on the door, nobody answers. I leave a copy of a contract and a letter explaining who I am. Well, within a day, maybe two, he calls me back. And so that contract, that letter got elicited that response that I was trying to get. We had a good conversation. He had gotten letters from other people in the mail. I was the only one that gave him a contract, the only one that stopped by there like that. And for him, he wasn't, he was willing to sell if he had to, but he was, he was working on a plan to help pay off some taxes and some other stuff. But he said, look, if I decide to sell, I've got your information, I'll call you. And so we didn't get the deal, but I did get in, I got my answer. I got in contact, I wasn't left wondering what if, what if I would have done this? What if I would have done that? Could I have gotten a deal? Now I know. I did everything I could. You know, you don't win them all, but I won't be surprised. He may call me next week ready to sell. So who else would you skip trace? You know, I tell people all the time, skip tracing is not just for sellers or property owners. Uh, here's some examples of other people when, when and who you might use skip tracing on. First and foremost, your buyers. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the term wholetailing. Well, one way that we have used skip tracing is looking at a, in a hot area or an area with a lot of investor activity, you're gonna see a lot of cash buyers in that area. So if you look up the MLS, you find your cash buyers, what do you know about them? You already know right off the bat that they're willing to pay a premium for properties in your area, wh wherever your deal is. So if they're buying at the MLS, off the MLS, they're buying at a premium because they either don't care or they don't know better. So you could skip trace these people that are buying properties near the one you're trying to either wholesale or whatever your exit strategy is. In effect, it's like you're advertising on the MLS. You're going after the same buyers. So it's, it's really an effective way to try and maximize your deals without actually having to go through the process of double closing, paying those closing costs, and if you do hotel, I know some people do flat fee listings or some people will just go ahead and list it with a realtor. It's a way to save on all those costs. Um, another, in other circumstances, you'll find properties with a lot of title issues. Maybe there's old liens or judgments. That's not uncommon that, you know, there's a judgment against somebody and maybe the company that got the judgment or the person has just disappeared. So, Skip tracing can help 
help you to get those liens and judgments cleared as needed when you're, when you're dealing with uh, some of your more complicated or uh, cumbersome title issues. Uh, another example, just, a, just, just to give you a real example of how we use skip tracing buyers to maximize a deal. Uh, we've done it a few times, but uh, we did a deal in you know, Brenham, Texas. Anybody that knows Bluebell Ice Cream, it's right outside of Brenham. We did a, it was the first time we, we did an acreage deal. We just kind of wanted to test something and we went and we locked up 12 acres. We actually bought it, got the owners to, is an inherited property, got the owners to finance it to us. And we weren't sure what we were going to do. We thought maybe we would advertise it and sell it with owner financing. We got it under such good terms at such a low price. We didn't, we just said, let's lock it up. We'll figure out the exit later. Well, one of the issues we had when I was trying to access the property was there was no gate off of the road. So I wanted to see if the neighbor would let us access his gate to get to our property. Uh, so while I'm looking up who the neighbor, I'm looking in the appraisal district like we covered in the previous section, looking at the map, I noticed the neighbor owns all the land surrounding our piece of land. Give him, and I think, you know what, there's a good chance he wants this 12 little acres that's breaking up the continuity in his land. We call him up and uh, they end up offering us a cash price. He, they really wanted that 12 acres. They had been trying to find the family that inherited the property. When he found out I owned it now, he wasn't happy that he missed out, but he was definitely interested in buying it. He became our cash buyer, saved us on having to do a survey. There was a family cemetery on the land, save us from having to deal with that because he would keep it there. It was a win-win-win for everybody. But had I not skip traced him, I we just had to list it and settle for what we got, which would have been owner financing and it still would have been a solid deal, but this guy paid a premium because he was so motivated. Uh, and that was a deal, if I recall correctly, we made $38,000 $38, on it. So just keep that in mind. It's not just for sellers. Use it for your buyers too as needed. So again, my name is Larry Higgins. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot me an email at larry at skipgenie.com or you can submit your questions or comments in the comment section below. And we'll see you in the next section.